Can I tell you some cool news? We've booked five transfigured conferences. Yep. We said we would do up to six. Five's looking like a lot, so we don't know yet, but um, Ohio, here, clearly. So just so you know, Transfigured Conferences, that's Chris Blackaby and I. Yep, teaching six to eight sessions on the new creation gospel. Um, And we're getting dates, details, times, and all that stuff rolled out, but Nashville, Hawaii, Oklahoma, Ohio, Washington, Sri Lanka, Venice, yeah, that's seven. Two of them are uh, not pegged down, but they're confirmed. So we're going to take this gospel all over the world this year. Amen? Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 3. We're still in the Unveiled series. We're going to lay foundation from this passage to go in divin- divinization and deification, okay? And I know that sounds so wild, but I promise you that I will give you all of the tools necessary to be able to receive this message. Here's what I want to ask you first. Are you even willing to consider this? Okay. We've been so ingrained with the Western penal substitution gospel that it is nearly impossible to pull us away from what we've been taught by the traditions of our fathers. I've given some of this insight in weeks past. What I'd like to do is spend about five minutes laying this foundation before we get into this topic because it is going to be by far the hardest one to swallow, okay? So how many of you know who Jesus is? Okay. Sometimes we look at the story of Jesus as so mystical, we don't realize that he was a real person with family and real friends and real disciples. So we look at the story of Jesus, and then we're unwilling to look at the things that surrounded the life of Jesus, such as who did he train? Who did who he trained train? Right? Where can we find a, an undiluted version of the gospel, and who would be the most authoritative to be able to listen to? Well, let me tell you. Jesus trained John, Right? John the Beloved, their relationship in Scripture was the most intimate relationship that he'd had with a disciple. John referred to himself as the Beloved, but John also had two things that qualified him to write things that other people couldn't write. One is he was willing to ask, right? When they were at the Last Supper, there were 12 disciples there. Only one decided to ask, who is going to be the one that betrays you? So we know that in his character and in his standing, he's willing to ask Jesus questions that other people aren't. Therefore, he probably has answers that other people don't. Get it? Also, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospel narratives that are in your New Testament. And of those four gospel narratives, only one of them, follow me, has revelatory information. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us a historical context of the life and ministry of Jesus. John literally opens his letter with revelation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. To compare how these people found Jesus in their lineage to prove that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a natural view, a sensual view of Jesus' ministry, when they wanted to find Jesus' history, they went through his biological lineage, right? Maybe you don't know because we always skip that chapter because it says begot, 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 right? Right? So they found Jesus according to his natural lineage because they're used to identifying people according to their natural origin. So they see Jesus this way. John sees Jesus this way. They see Jesus to and fro. John sees Jesus up and down. Rather than going through his natural begots, Jesus, excuse me, John simply says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's that simple, almost as if he was making fun of the natural view that they had of Jesus. So John has information that was not disclosed during Jesus' life and earthly ministry. John's revelation comes from a different place, right? Okay, so that guy has writings, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation that encompass some of the most difficult revelations that you and I have to to contend with. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, 
John trained Polycarp. There's a very good chance that Polycarp was around when Jesus was training John. Polycarp trained Irenaeus. Irenaeus trained Gregory of Nyssa, or and Athanasius. Okay, so we've got four generations of people that preserved the gospel of their fathers that came from the mouth of Jesus in the life of John. You understand what kind of authority something like that carries? If you study those writings, you cannot find the gospel that we preach. As a matter of fact, the rest of the world refers to this gospel as the Western or Latin gospel. What is the Western or Latin gospel? The Western or Latin gospel is a gospel that emphasizes Jesus appeasing an angry father on your behalf and making sure that you escape disembodied terror after you die. All I'm saying is this. If appeasing an angry God and escaping hell were the emphasis of the gospel, then Jesus, Paul, and John did a terrible job of communicating that. Okay, we're not going to create another doctrine. I'm not going to make any harsh stances. All I'm saying is that's clearly not what the gospel is about. Right? Irenaeus, first generation after John, when asked what the gospel is, he said it's the bestowal of incorruptibility on humanity. Athanasius' answer, who was trained by Irenaeus, says it is God becoming a man so that men could become God. Sounds wild, right? Until you read your Bible with any amount of vulnerability and integrity. And you'll find that that is the only message that you and I have to apprehend from this text. You with me? Are you even willing to consider this? Okay, before we get into this, I might as well just give you something else that's hard to swallow. Okay, and I'm not trying to be... If, if I'm too controversial, you'll stop listening. That's not what I'm trying to do. But do you realize that the, the invitation to follow Jesus was a three-and-a-half-year invitation? And then Jesus started to use language towards the end of his earthly ministry where he was clearly passing the baton, right? He said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said, you are lights. You are city set on a hill. The invitation to follow Jesus was actually demonstratively different post-resurrection. The resurrection changed everything. After the resurrection, you can find it in Luke chapter 24. You don't have to go there. We're not going to talk about it right now. But the resurrected Jesus was with his disciples, and it said that Jesus wanted to go further, but the disciples constrained him. And he went in and had dinner with them instead. Post-resurrection, sons of God are in charge. Hebrews chapter 4 says that he is raised and seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places, and he has sat down at the right hand of God. Do you know why people sit down? Because they're done. Acts chapter 2, verse 31 says, he, Heaven received Jesus until the restoration of all things. King David said, Your Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until your enemies have made your footstool. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ brought us into this age where humans are responsible to bring the reality of heaven to earth and act as their creator and take dominion over all things. This is Hebrews chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2. Like, it's just the gospel message. Are you with me? Are you willing to consider this? The implications of coming away from the Western gospel and realizing that the gospel wasn't about appeasing a wrathful God, but about revealing a loving God and taking you out of a cycle of sin and death. I don't feel like we can move past this quite yet. Hmm. How many of you are familiar with Thomas in the Bible? Do you remember the question that Thomas asked? 
Show us what? The Father. Show us the Father. You guys had some good answers. It's cool. Show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient for us. What did Jesus say? How long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen him. Your Bible says that no one has seen God at any time. Do you realize why these things are important? Because things that were said about a God that are not reflected in the life of Jesus aren't true. Your Bible says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. Jesus Christ has declared him. Jesus came with an authority to display the Father that nobody in 4,000 years of human history ever had. Adam cost humanity intimacy with the Father by his own delusion, and the Bible says that that which gives birth to flesh is flesh, meaning everybody that ever came through the lineage of Adam was born in a delusion that they were separate from God. No human being that ever penned anything was able to accurately describe the Father until the Father put on flesh and dwelt among us and showed us who the Father actually is. We spent over 400 years, actually I think it's 1,200 years, stoning people that broke the law. Jesus shows up just to prove that the Father doesn't throw stones. Am I right or wrong? Does it say or does it not say in Jeremiah chapter 7, I did not command your fathers when they came out of Egypt it, regarding burnt offerings and sacrifice. He lit over and over in Psalms in the New Testament, burnt offering and sacrifice I do not desire. I take no pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices. So what do the Egypt, Egypt, excuse me, Israelites do? Burnt offerings and sacrifices. They've got no other way. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus declares the Father. Which means that the Western gospel about a hippie son standing between us and a God that wants to kill us can't be true. Jesus came to reveal the actual love of the Father towards you so that you could come out of sin and death. The gospel of morality and behavior modification does not fix sin, it causes it. The first person that ever preached the gospel of behavior modification and morality was the devil. Do this to be like him. So important. I have faith that we can break this, but do you realize that most of the reasons that atheists don't believe in God, I agree with, and I don't believe in the God that they don't believe in either. God is love, but he's also wrath. Is not a scripture. It's an excuse for not understanding him. Get it? Okay. Now, it's going to get hard. If that wasn't tough, this is, I promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, we're going to go all the way down to verse 14 because we've covered this every week. I just want to, to make a point of something. Verse 14 says, Their minds were blinded until this day, and the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Okay, so what happens when you read the Old Testament without Jesus? It's veiled. It's unclear, right? The, the Bible, by its own admission, says you can't read the Bible without Christ. So if, if you look what they would call literally and grammatically at the Old Testament, you wouldn't get revelation from it. You'd, all, you'd only get fear and trembling, right? But the veil is taken away in Christ. Christ is the lens by which you are able to perceive what the prophets were trying to say. No one has seen God at any time, but he has declared him. But even to this day, which is post-resurrection, so this means that this is in the same time frame as you, when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. So that means that no matter what dispensation you're in, even if it's post-resurrection, if you read things about, man, if you read things about God desiring to kill Canaanites and stone people that broke the Mosaic law, if you read those things and you don't understand what they were trying to accomplish in Christ, if you don't use Jesus to establish truth, what we like to say here is if you don't use Jesus to interpret your Bible and instead you use your Bible to interpret Jesus... You will always end in error, okay? Let me put this in perspective for you. 
Do you see how big this is? At the end of John, it says the world, all of creation, is not a big enough bookshelf. The world is not a big enough bookshelf to hold the record of Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry. So do you think you can fit his entire nature in here? Nope. You can fit all of God in all of Jesus, but you can't fit all of God on black and white pages. Got it? Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. Nevertheless, when one turns away, excuse me, turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Spirit, the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, we all with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Do you understand how significant that is? We're being transformed into the same image. If you look in a mirror, what do you see? This isn't a trick question. Literally, when you woke up in the, this morning and looked in the mirror, what do you see? Yourself, right? So if the glory of the Lord is beheld now in a mirror, when you see him clearly, you can see you clearly because the two have become one. There isn't a divine version of Jesus and you're the human version of Jesus. His intention is to div divinize and deify you so that you are everything he is and nothing that he's not. We see as early as Luke chapter 24 that Jesus Christ handed off the torch to humanity that he trusted to accomplish greater works than he did. Do you think you could accomplish greater works with a lesser nature? It's impossible. It'll never happen. So can I walk you through something? This will, this will be captivating for you. I'll reference 1 Peter, we don't have to go there, but do you realize that Peter said that you are a partaker of divine nature? Right? Have you ever been a partaker of apple pie? Yep. Religion has taught you that you're a spectator of divine nature. You stand at a distance and watch it in awe. Have you ever been a spectator of apple pie? Do you have a preference? <laughs> Absolutely. I have a preference also. It's clear. I don't desire to spectate divinity. God does not desire that I be a spectator of his divinity. He made me one with him that I might partake of his nature. The destiny of humanity... The reason that you walked in these doors, Ephesians chapter 4, says to, is to be brought to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The reason it says Christ is because that is the divine component, the only begotten of Jesus Christ. It did not say, oh, you ready for some tough stuff? It didn't say that you are the embodiment of his three and a half year ministry. You are the embodiment of his resurrection. As he is, so are you in this world. You are not the human form of God. You are everything he is and nothing that he's not. He desires that you be divinized and deified. And I know we're going to get in trouble for this already. Just, just walk with me. Okay? You are not a spectator of divine nature. You are a partaker of divine nature, which means you get to bring it into yourself. And if you remember nothing else, if you remember nothing else, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John found Jesus according to his natural, excuse me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke found Jesus according to his natural lineage. John gives us revelatory information and lets us know that the word was in the beginning, the word was God, and the word was with God, which means he gives us better insight into origin. Both Genesis and John start with the words in the beginning. They just recount a different record. This is the most important information that was revealed through John by the Holy Spirit that has never been before understood in 4,000 years. Okay? Genesis says, in the beginning, everything was created. John says, in the beginning, everything already existed. I don't know how to say this big enough. I don't know how to write this with large enough letters. You were divine before you were human.
You were found before you were ever lost. You were one before you were ever separate. You were alive before you were ever dead. The most natural state that you have ever existed in was in total union, total likeness, and total divinity with him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians says that he chose us where? In him. When? Before the foundation of the world. But we have so allowed the Western gospel to define who we are that just like the first 4,000 years, they couldn't see anything but what they had experienced. They couldn't. So all they knew of was creation and creation's experiences. John is the first guy that brings us revelation that says it's bigger than this. It's more than this. As a matter of fact, there was a work that was finished before or apart from the foundation of the word and creation is simply an expression of something that's already true somewhere else. Genesis says you were born from the womb. God says you were born from the word. (sighs) Genesis is not your Genesis. Humanity began in divinity. You were divine before you were ever human. Do you get it? So I want you to understand the atonement, okay? I've I've tried not to to use the packaged theological terms because usually when we do that, we just boil things down to a principle that we have to agree on a thousand different things. But here's what you'll find. Penal substitutionary theory teaches you that the atonement lasted three and a half days. Death, burial, resurrection. Solved all of your problems. God's mad at you. He needs somebody to punch in the face, so he makes it his kid. Right? You ever been so mad you punched your kid in the face? If you raise your hand, I'll call CPS. That's how much I disagree with it. No, I mean, think about it. Like, if you do what we say God did, we put you in jail. Yep, so mad I can't contain my anger. I just got a ticket. There he is. Nope. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to reveal our value, to display the Father's love towards us, not to appease his wrath that was aimed at us, right? The, <laughs> he offered himself. Nobody took him. Nobody killed him. He offered himself. Get it? Okay. You were divine before you were ever human. The same perspective that lasted 4,000 years of us only being able to be uh, aware of natural human history was undone by John. John says that you were born from the word when Genesis says that you were born from the womb. Understanding your beginning helps you understand your destiny. He's the alpha and these the omega. He's the blueprint and he's the finished product. He's where you start and he's where you end. The atonement, according to Western theology, is three and a half days. The atonement, according to the first century church fathers, is 33 and a half years. He started taking away your delusion in his birth. His birth overcame something for you. Do you know what it overcame? That which is born of flesh is flesh. So every single human being that was born according to the biological human line was born thinking that they were separate from the father. So you know what Jesus has to do? He has to come through a virgin and have God as his biological father. He's begotten of the Holy Spirit. So listen, his conception is part of your atonement. His birth is part of your atonement. Becoming a millionaire within a few months of being born is part of your atonement. He lost everything you gained through deception. He gained everything you lost through deception, and he gave it back to you the way it was intended to be from before the foundation of the world. The atonement did not change you. The atonement revealed you in him. Okay? He skipped the biological narrative and just simply said, this is supposed to be you. 
So he spent 33 and a half years fixing our delusion so that we could come into truth, right? Is it good? All right, I'm almost there, I promise. Oh, this is one you're going to get mad about. John chapter 10, verse 31. You guys have been with me so long, you just don't get mad anymore. I really appreciate that. Ooh. Divinized and deified. Don't forget those words. First of all, I'm going to ask you, how many of you ever read the past, or excuse me, the chapter of John and the or book of John chapter 10? You have? Okay, let me ask you this. How'd you miss this? Just making an assumption here, but how'd you miss this? Ready? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown from my father. Which of these are you stoning me for? Fair question, right? All I've done, heal the sick, raise the dead, feed the hungry. Like, why are you mad, bro? And they said... We are not stoning you because of your good works, but for blasphemy. Because you, ready, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered and said, is it not written in your law? He's quoting Old Testament scripture. I said you are God's. Does it say it or does it not? Okay, it says it. How'd you miss it? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? Does it say it? How'd you miss it? God in scripture said humans are gods. And then he says, So why are you mad at me that I'm saying I'm God's Son? I'm going to take you on a trip through this that might be a little hard to walk through because I don't think I've ever heard it taught this way, but it's really important, okay? Creation is looking for sons of God, right? There is something in your Bible called a hoyos son of God. A hoyos son of God is a mature son of God. And what I want you to understand, too, this is going to be really helpful, that um, Jewish adoption is not the same as... Western adoption. There aren't very many cases, or I would say, probably say this safely, there are zero cases in Jewish culture where Western adoption is necessary. Okay, think it. Imagine the Jews are a moralistic company of people. How many people do you think have to give up their children as Jews? Zero, right? If they are orphaned, they go to the next of kin. If next of kin are gone, they go to closest friends. There is no Western adoption understanding in Jewish culture. Okay? Eastern adoption is a hoyos ceremony where a father takes his son and he baptizes him and he holds his hand over his head and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They adopt their own children. In the day that they're adopted, they are recognized as fit to take over the family business. Okay? So why, do, why am I telling you this? Because our Western understanding has made us think that we were orphaned and that God was kind enough to come pick us up and bring us into his house. The gospel says that you were always his. You were never not his child. And now in Christ, you are his hoyos, trusted, beloved son. That was your adoption. Not somebody that was on the outside brought inside, but somebody that was in the house and is now in authority. Better news? Okay. Now, 1 John chapter 3, 1 and 2 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children 
of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, right? So this is, his, this is John's confession. Again, we just qualified John as a revelatory teacher, and he's writing this epistle saying that we are now children of God, but we don't know what we're going to be. Again, you have to put this in the proper context because he's about to say something that would easily give you permission to not become what you already are. The Bible says right here that we are now children of God, but we don't know what we're going to be. The next line says, (laughs) but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him because we'll see him as he is. So what's that mean? Our identity is fully connected to his. When you see him clearly, you see everything that you are. Now, here's the problem. We use this passage to push our identity out into our future so we become something someday. This is John saying, we now are children of God. We don't know what we're going to become because he hasn't been revealed to us yet. But when he's revealed, we'll know who we are. Do you know what the next book that John the Revelator wrote after his epistles The revelation of Jesus Christ. He wrote the book that he was foretelling. Now you know what you're supposed to be. Do you know who you're supposed to be? Hair like wool, eyes like fire, sword in your mouth, a voice like many waters, feet like bronze. He has been completely displayed as everything that you and I were ever meant to be. You good with his gospel? It's the only one I got. (laughs) If you see him, you see yourself. When you get introduced to the unveiled Jesus, you get introduced to who you were always meant to be. You get it? Divinized, deified. If you as a human being have a difficult time with those terms, you have no idea where you came from. You were divine before you were ever human. You were cut from the same fabric. I don't remember who the prophet was. Return to the rock from which you were hewn. God. Do you get it? Mm-hmm. Yep. In Genesis, God gives us insight. Let me do this. Romans 1.20 says that in God's visible creation, he clearly demonstrates his attributes. Right, so we can look at Genesis to see what God's like, but we have to look at Jesus to see who God is. But looking at Genesis, we can see that everything that he made has its seed within itself, or it had a male and a female to procreate after its own kind. Right? If an oak tree drops a seed into the ground, and it grows, what does it become? An oak tree. A mini oak tree? A light version of the full flavor? A weak oak tree? Half an oak tree? Nope. Oak trees produce oak trees, right? If two lions, male and female, procreate, they generate what? A lion, because everything about God demonstrates that he reproduces after his own kind. So if God has children... right or wrong, divinized, deified. The entire principle of the gospel was to get you to see who you were before the foundation of the world, not to give you a new moral compass, not to give you a new set of behaviors. The moment that you were given a new set of behaviors in Genesis, you came into the cycle of sin and death. He has come to give you righteousness and life, divinized and deified. Are you okay with this? Are you willing to consider this? When we see him, I'm going to read that last line again. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This same author, could you, oh my God, could you imagine having this this letter sitting on your desk? You're like, I wrote to him, when we see him, we're going to know exactly who we are. And then he gets sucked up into heaven. Literally walks through the door, invited to come up here, and he's like, bro, like, I, 
I saw him. I know who we are. He comes back down, pens the letter, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he has the fullness of humanity on paper, and he's able to recognize to everybody who they now are. In John's encounter in Revelation, he saw Jesus, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and he fell down as dead. Twenty chapters later, The angel comes to John and he says, come here, I have something else to show you. I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he looks at her and guess what happens? He falls down as dead twice. He falls down in the presence of angels because he saw Christ, he saw you. And both of them were equally as glorious. Divinized and deified. Are you okay with it? I'm almost done. Go to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Man, I thought I was almost done. Yeah, we're, just, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish there. Romans, chapter 8. So I wanna just mention something real quick. We, we know, right, we, we talk about this all the time from Romans chapter 8, that all creation is crying out with birth pangs for the manifestation of the sons of God, right? And, and we say these things just so we don't get mixed up. Creation is not waiting for the return of Jesus. Creation's not waiting for a rapture. Creation's not waiting for God to magic, magically, like, sprinkle his, I don't know, angel, ooh. Nope. nope. Magic dust, magic dust, wave his wand, yeah, and fix everything, right? That's not what creation's waiting on. Creation is waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God, but do you know what else is waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God? God. God. Acts 2, 30, no, 3, 20, sorry, 3, 21. It says that heaven received Jesus until the restoration of all things. Until the establishment of a theocracy. Jesus is waiting on you. I'm going to go here, okay? Then we'll get to Romans 8. All of creation is a manifestation of the recognized identity of humanity. All of it. Okay? Okay? How did Jesus get his communication to disciples that were were in other territories? He wrote a letter, and then he enlisted the services of a person or an animal to transport it, right? How did Paul get his letters to Ephesus? He wrote it on paper, stationary, then he enlisted the services of an animal or a person to transport it. Fast forward 1,500 years. How did Luther get his letter to the church? Yep. 1,500 years. No advancements in communication, architecture, technology whatsoever. Nothing changed. 1525, that's Luther, right? We go from the 1500s to the late 1800s before transportation starts changing. Do you know what also happened in the 1800s? the restoration of the Holy Spirit to the body. Early 1900s, restoration of tongues and interpretation. Mid-1800s, restoration of prophecy, healing. 1980s, 1990s, identity, five-fold ministry. We're standing in the 2000s. Do you realize what happened between 1967 and right now? We went from letters to faxes. Faxes to emails. Emails to phones. Phones to to mobile phones, mobile phones to emails. Last night, I did a conference for a church in Venice, California. My camera was looking at my face while it was simultaneously looking at theirs. 1,800 years with absolutely zero, zero advancement in creation. The moment that humanity starts to put on divinity, everything changes. Everything changes. So the pace by which we apprehend our identity is the most important factor in the pace by which creation is redeemed. Creation 
is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Jesus is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. The only hope that creation has is you. This is God's plan, not mine. And we've sat under so much Western teaching that it's difficult to swallow a pill like this. But it's just what it is. Good? Romans 8, this will be the last thing we talk about today. <clears throat> and we know that all things work together. We're in verse 28, by the way. For the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose for whom he foreknew, okay? Okay? Does it mean that God just has some information before you're created on earth, or did he actually know you in himself before the foundation of the world? Yep, John 1, Ephesians 1 would both indicate that he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. So before you existed in a womb or on earth, he knew you, right? And you might think, oh, that's so special. No, it's more than special. You were divinity and embodied and entwined in union before you existed in a body. You were divine before you were human. The most natural state of your essence is divinity. Humanity was added later. Humanity was only added to divinity so that authority could be rendered on earth. The reason you have a body is so you can do God's will, right? In burnt offering and sacrifice, you have no desire but a body thou hast prepared for me to do your will, O God. You get it? <clears throat> okay. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see the equality in these kind of statements? So in, in John, it says, which one of my good works are you going to kill me for? We're not going to kill you for your good works. We're killing you for blasphemy because you being a man called yourself equal with God. Well, what did this passage say? Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his beloved son, that his son would be the firstborn of a bunch more that are just like him that would come after him. Moreover... Whom he predestined, he called. Who he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. In the West, we have said that glorification comes with death. This says glorification is a past work. He called you, he justified you, he glorified you. He did that if he foreknew you. If he foreknew you, he predestined you. And your destiny is divinization and deification. Be conformed into the image of his beloved son. Does it say it or doesn't it? Everyone's like, wow, you preach the Bible. I'm like, I got nothing else. For real, I've got the revelation from heaven and this. What then shall we say to these things? Now, again, I want you to see this in the right light because most of the time we just use this as a good bumper sticker. He's trying to marry these two ideas together. If he foreknew us, he predestined us, and if our destiny is divinization and deification, then how on earth could we ever consider ourselves separate from him? He's not just giving you a pep talk. He's saying, then what? <laughs> Ready? Then what shall we say to these things? If God's for us, what could ever be against us? He didn't spare his own son. He delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also, excuse me, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Ready? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Our gospel in the West has taught us that it's God that brought the charge against God's elect. Your Bible says no one can bring a charge against God's elect because it's God that justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ that died. Our gospel has taught us that it's God that condemns. And also, excuse me, and furthermore is also risen. He's even at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. What could ever separate us from the love of God? Should it be tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? It's written. For your sake we're killed all day. We're counted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. I'm persuaded. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, not things present or things to come, no height or depth or any created thing would ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Do you understand why he's trying to marry these things? Because it had already crept into the church that it's God who condemns, that it's God that brought a charge against you. He's saying, if he foreknew you, he predestined you, and your destiny was to be divinized, how on earth would somebody ever accuse you? God justified you. How would anyone ever condemn you? It's Christ that died. I'm convinced. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. No created thing, not even that serpent in the garden could ever separate us from the love of God. God's love pursued you from before the foundation of the world. It never stopped. You were alienated from the life of God in your own mind. You were alienated from the life of God by Adam's dissolution. God has been chasing you for 6,000 years because he knew you before the foundation of the world and he foreknew you and he predestined you to be divinized and deified in Jesus' name. Amen? Is it good? Would you guys stand with me? Um, Miss Becca, could I borrow you for a moment? Uh, So Miss Kelly Love is one of the leaders of our ministry team, and she sent uh, Shanda a word of knowledge that she has that I'm going to share. So what a word of knowledge is, is when God allows you to know something that you would not know um, through observation or naturally learned information. God's like, this is what I want you to know because I desire to reach somebody's heart with love. Okay, that's what a word of knowledge is. I'm going to read it from the text so I don't mess it up. I believe there are people here who are suffering from a heartache. Kelly says, my heart is heavy and hurting. I don't know if it's someone grief or loss, something that's too heavy as if they're about to crumble. It's so severe. When God brings a word of knowledge, the reason he brings a word of knowledge is because he desires to heal what he sees that isn't in line with his nature. Right? The Bible says, if you're carrying something, you should give it to him. Be anxious for nothing. So I'm going to invite Miss Kelly, would you come? So I, ha- I actually know that there's a person here that's in this situation. Um, and just so you all, we'll just bring it to the light. So um, the person that is carrying something so heavy they feel like they're about to crumble, that is grief or loss, Um, Would you come up and just let the ministry team pray for you and and have agreement? You don't have to be scared either. Nobody's going to push you over or make you say anything. You literally don't have to do anything but let somebody pray with you. There's one, two. Um, Could we have some more of the ministry team come on up? Jill? Yeah. All right. So if you're on the ministry team, would you like face that way so people know who you are. All right. Neil, you got Bill there? All right. Anybody else need prayer this morning? Okay. So we're just going to allow this. You guys... You guys are officially dismissed. I'm going to pray over all of you, and we're going to allow Miss Becca to keep playing for privacy's sake up here, and we're going to allow anybody else that's carrying grief or heaviness or something that they need to offload. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and if this is somebody online, um, we will have our tech team watching our YouTube and Facebook comments, and then we'll make sure that somebody reaches out So, um, I'm going to pray over all of you.
to receive the word that was preached, and then we're going to allow whatever needs to happen here, happen here. Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for worship today. We thank you that you've graced us and blessed us with your presence and perfection. Father, we ask that the, this word be sealed in our hearts, that, that your destiny of our divinization coming fully into you and expressing your dominion and authority on earth and the love of God, the goodness, the kindness, the patience, the long-suffering. Father, we ask that when people see us, they see, see you. It's that simple. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. All right, I love you all very much, and I will talk to you soon.